Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Ryan. Welcome to um, tonight's webinar on training, recovery and reform. Uh, I'm delighted you've taken the time to come here. I'm also delighted that we've got a great panel um, uh, and I'll let the panel introduce themselves in detail when they speak themselves. But we've got Anna Olson Brown, who's um, the chair for the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges uh, trainee doctor group and also a clinical advisor for HE. And she finished training during COVID, so uh, I'm delighted she's here. We've got uh, Mike Robinson, who's in his last year of vascular surgery training uh, and delighted he's here. Matt Clark, who is, I think, roughly halfway through, Matt, is that right? Uh, he's training um, uh, um, uh, as, I kind of forgotten, Matt, what you are, my apologies, but you're from the Academy of Medical Degree College's trainee group. Did you say neurophysiology? Or, or uh, ne neuropathology. <laughs> neuropathology, yes, of course, I should remember that, sorry. And uh, we've got uh, Gita, Gita Menon, um, who's a, a postgraduate dean for London, and Shona McLeod, who's a deputy medical director for HEE. So, with no further ado, over to Shona. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So, next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you about the training recovery program and give you an overview of the different elements of the program. So, next slide, please. I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone this, but the pandemic has had a huge impact on education and training and it's still casting a shadow and it will do for some time yet. It's disrupted um, training by having elective care cancelled, having exams cancelled, having training cancelled, having trainees redeployed, having trainees miss experience, having them have an experience in words which is mainly COVID based. So you have a monochrome learning experience and it's had a particular impact on craft specialties and on specialties which require procedural skills, but it has impacted on individuals as well. And there are many trainees who've been impacted personally or relatives have. There are trainees who have had personal and family concerns. It's left an awful lot of people feeling exhausted and demoralised. And everyone is aware of the pressure. For some, there have been opportunities with COVID and some excitement. And for an awful lot of us, it's something that we are learning to cope with and thinking about how we catch up from. Next slide. Thank you. So the training recovery programme had three aims. The first one um, was to start off to get training on track as quickly as possible. And in that early stage, we had to make sure that recruitment could happen so that people could progress in training and so that doctors at the start of their training could get jobs. And we had to make sure that people could have the assessments to allow them to progress. And innocently, at the beginning, we thought we might get through by August 2020. August 21, we have, I think, mastered that stage of the recovery programme in that we have kept training going. We have been able to review the recruitment processes and learn from them and adapt further. We're now in the second stage trying to recover and we are not there yet. There are huge challenges. But there's also been some fantastic work done by educators all around the country, DMEs, individual supervisors, heads of school, training programme directors and trainees having ideas themselves as to how to get training back on track. And that's the bit that will help us take this forward in the future if we can embed some of these solutions then in the future, we will have a better training programme, not just one that has limped through COVID. There are still real challenges. The main challenge being how we marry that up with service recovery, which is so important with the backlog, how we manage the capacity for training with the pressure on trainees and on trainers, and how we make use of opportunities like the independent sector. So next slide, please. So oh, in these boxes, we have what we did to start off with, our approach to training, which was to access um, £26 million, which sounds like a huge amount, but spread out round the country 
has made a difference, but hasn't made the problem go away. We worked to reduce the risk of training extensions, which was significant at the beginning of 2021 in August and is now less in 2022. But um, there are there are still issues and we very much have a need to individualize the um, training programs based on individualized planning and discussions that trainees have had. We very much got to look at how we support educators and how we support trainees, and we have negotiated to have an extra 25 million for next year. Again, that sounds like a lot, but actually once you distribute it around the country, there isn't as much and we are very much working to identify the programmes at most risk and the specialties at most risk to try and target interventions there. And we're learning from the recovery solutions that people have put in place to make the best suggestions for how local areas take things forward. So can we have the next slide, please? That's how to contact us um, if you want to know more about training recovery and um, if you have ideas about things we should be doing. Now, that's an overview of the programme. I'm going to pass on now to Matt to give you a view of what it's been like for trainees and what the issues are from the trainee perspective. So over to you, Matt. Thanks very much, Shona. Uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Matt Clark. I'm a clinical lecturer in neuropathology, but also the current chair of the Academy of Medical Royal College's trainee doctors group, and also the chair of the trainee advisory committee for the Royal College of Pathologists. And it's a pleasure to talk to you tonight about the current training recovery challenges from the trainee perspective. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a bit of background to the situation um, that we're facing at the moment and I've, I've been going through over the last few months. Next slide, please. Uh, as shown as nicely illustrated and demonstrated, the, there has been a huge impact on of COVID-19 on the impact on training, and it cannot be underestimated, and also on the trainers as a part of this as well. And that's through a number of different methods that uh, it could be patient uh, trainees being redeployed to other clinical settings. It could be the pause in training itself, so lack of training opportunities and the impact of a lack of assessments and pausing of examinations as well. So all trainees across all specialties have been impacted in some way, whether that's pa uh, patient facing specialties or non patient facing specialties. And we're now seeing this impact extending as service recovery um, is taking place with increased pressures on trainees in terms of workload. But also we've had other waves of the pandemic coming into play as well, and also winter pressures, which have further exacerbated uh, this difficult situation that trainees find themselves in. Each specialty has been impacted in different ways, um, whether that's the acute specialties that are patient facing or those behind the scenes, perhaps with radiology and pathology as well, all have been impacted across the different, uh, diff in different ways across this process, but also in terms of different stages of training. So those that are new to their specialties haven't had the necessary introductions to the training they would normally expect to see, but also those at the other end of training who are perhaps thinking about transitioning or at the end of training, transitioning to become a consultant, have also been feeling pressures where they haven't perhaps got the time to explore the independence that they would normally have during this period as well. And one of the other major things that needs to be considered is that these these doctors in training are human beings as well and they have families and personal lives that have been significantly impacted by this. We all have friends, we all have families that we've been concerned about, even our own health as well. And the impact on well-being of these challenges, these anxieties um, related to their training and progression cannot be underestimated as well and have been a significant problem that, have, that has arisen through this. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges that are affecting um, some of the related to the training recovery at the moment? So the one of the things that the ATDG have done recently is to conduct a survey of its representatives looking at the specialty specific issues related to training recovery. And the responses we've had across seven different specialties um, across four nations have been really insightful related to this. And one of the key messages that came out from this is that trainees were not aware of a specific recovery training recovery program related to their specialty. 
which may be related to issues of communication related to this, but also it may be there may be inequalities in whether this is being implemented across the different regions of the country as well. It also showed that trainees at different stages are being significantly impacted and now with as training is recovering, there is more competition between junior and senior trainees for training opportunities um, now that things are being re-implemented. There's also been one of, one of the things that also needs to be considered when we're in training recovery is the impact on those um, in different sectors. So people working less than full time, full time or also those with childcare provision as well. And when we're thinking about training recovery, we need to be thinking about our equality, diversion, diversity and inclusion principles and making sure that there is equality in, in this programme related to all as well. Next slide, please. So one of the other things that the survey response showed was that there were some positive things that had come from this work so far as well. So particularly the surgical trainees, some of the surgical trainees reported that there was access to NHS operative lists in the independent sector, and there was also funding for laparoscopic training sets as well. However, this should be, it should be noted that this is only specific regions where this was actually taking place. And it is, so it's not something that's universally felt across different training areas across the country as well. So there are still inequalities in access to these different provisions. Um, one of the other th impacts related to this is including things like pathology, where certain centres have access to digital pathology um, infrastructure, and so that re training recovery has been um, better implemented there, whereas others across the country do not have access to this digital infrastructure, and so therefore there has been a slower response in that regard also. One of the other things that can't be underestimated is again the impact on exam preparation and assessments. So trainees being able to find time to prepare for their exams, but also trainer time in being able to dedicate um, time to actually help them prepare for these assessments and their exams and providing the training that they actually need to do this. And other things that we're finding as well are that there are big backlogs of trainees waiting at the opportunity to actually sit their exams at the moment as well, which is delaying their progress throughout their training period also. Um, some have also reported challenges related to transitioning to the next steps of training and becoming a consultant as well. So thinking about gaining that extra experience and independence in becoming a consultant, but also although maybe perhaps meeting the requirements to complete their, uh, their training, they do not feel confident in their ability in actually making that jump uh, to becoming a consultant. And so there are one of the important aspects of this is thinking about the individual needs um, of, their, of the trainee at these different stages of training. Next slide, please. So what are the, there are also some very general uh, challenges that need to be considered and related to training and recovery. And one of these is that one approach won't fit all specialties. And there, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, all the different specialties have been affected in their own particular way. And so there needs to be a targeted approach to these, uh, these particular challenges that the they are facing. And also focusing specifically, not just on the specialty, but on the individual needs. Again, individuals in, within the specialties have been impacted in different ways as well. And so training and recovery needs to be focused on what those requirements and what those trainees feel they need from this situation also. This, the pandemic has also highlighted several challenges that were actually present in training in the pre-pandemic era. So things like general working environment within primary and secondary care, access to 24 hour hot food, um, rest areas within hospitals, the, it, the difficulties with workforce numbers at the moment and the projections associated with those, the flexibility within training in being able to pursue different avenues within that or even working, deciding to work less than full time and also accessing study leave and budgets as well have also been were challenges beforehand, but were also are now further exacerbated by the impact of the pandemic. One of the things that's universally felt across the different specialties is that there needs to be a focus on digital and IT infrastructure to actually help training progress for the future as well, and also just to generally help trainees on their daily working lives within the hospitals and primary care also. And the impact on trainers. There's been a huge, uh, particularly with the restitution of services, trainers, uh, trainers being able to provide dedicated time to trainees and has been very limited because of the workload pressures. And so there's been a lack of supervision and training time which is again impacting on trainee progression and also finding the necessary number of assessors for different examinations as well. And another group of trainees who should be considered are the academic trainees who during the pandemic their lab, sp lab time has been severely limited with the closure of different research labs as well. They've lost their academic research time and again for the it's always a challenge to get trainees engaged with academic uh, academic work and so this may be something that we may see going forward as well going forward uh, so this is these are another group of trainees that may need further support
Next slide, please. So just to summarize some of those points that I mentioned, um, there are both general and individual impacts of the pandemic, but also the, the, implement, the re, uh, re implementation of services that we're seeing currently and the impact of uh, the subsequent waves and the winter pressures that we've had also. There are more general challenges, but also specialty specific challenges that need to be considered and strategies need to be developed to take these into consideration, but also keeping in mind the individual needs of the trainees as a priority also. Consideration needs to be given about the regional variability of training resources um, and the provision of these going forward as well to make sure that there is a quality for all trainees in these specialties within the training programmes. And focusing on things like IT, digital, flexibility and workforce, including the working environment, are key priorities in helping to make these overcome some of these challenges that trainees are experiencing um, now and in the, in the future as well. But this is a key opportunity to actually look ahead and think about the changes that would really help. This is not about just putting a plaster on, the, on a situation. We need to be thinking about what lasting changes can we actually see within these programmes to help trainees in the pro that, that come into the training programmes going forward as well. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand, hand on to my colleague, Dr Anna Olson brown who's going to again be talking about uh, the impact on, uh, on trainees and uh, of the pandemic on trainees and trainers as well. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. That's that's great. And I think beautifully laid out a lot of the challenges that we know everybody is facing from a training perspective. And I think also important to um, really mention the challenges for different specialties, trainees at different um, parts of their training, but also the challenge for educators and trainers um, to support their trainees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the sort of the, the data that we have that sort of backs up some of those challenges and then and then some of the interventions that we we've already put in place. I think we also really want to encourage people who are listening in to um, to contact us or actually go to their TPDs. We know that we haven't got all of the ideas that we could have. We know that we haven't got all of the recovery plans. We've we've worked really hard over the last 12 months to put a recovery plan in place and to involve all the right key stakeholders. And Shona was outlining that for us earlier. But actually, we know there's more to do. Um, and I think, you know, the trainees on the ground, those of you that are experiencing these challenges, you're the people that can tell us where where the gaps are and where we could be quite innovative in the way that we approach some of these things. So I think, you know, really this is, we're going to reiterate this point a number of times, but really this is a, um, a call to arms, if you like, about um, telling us more, communicating with us more, let us know where there are things that we can do and to support both locally, regionally and potentially nationally that can, that can help this recovery. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this basically just looks at the ARCP outcomes across all programmes over the past five years. And essentially, I think this is important because we can see that actually there are people that are progressing through training and there are but I think it's important to, to note that actually less progressing through training slightly in, in the last three years compared to the previous two which is almost certainly pandemic related um, also the fact that there is this introduction of the outcomes 10.1 and 10.2 um, which have been uh, awarded to, to quite a number of trainees during the pandemic um, and while we have got people that are CCTing and having outcome sixes we've still got a number of people who are who are not going to CCT as planned and progression is beco has become a challenge as a result directly as a result of the the pandemic. I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is at some point we are going to have to review how long we use 10.2 and 10.1 outcomes for, what that's going to mean in the future and how we handle what is going to be the ongoing impact of COVID. Is it right to continue managing it as a, as a differential outcome or is there other ways that we need to recognise it? That's a big piece of work that we haven't got to the end of yet but I think it is something that we're going to have to start thinking about how do we how do we handle these longer term impacts um, and is that via an outcome at ARCP or, or via a different outcome but certainly I think what this shows us in the main is the fact that there are people who are struggling with the um, with with the impact of COVID and the fact that that is still very much with us even as we go through this year's ARCP programme. Next slide please. So this I think is a really important slide so this basically looks at trainees who've had repeated COVID-19 related outcomes in 
2000 and 2021 and then 2021 22 and we can see that there are some specialties that are um, having ongoing impacts which means there is the impact of covid that is continuing to be a problem and as you can see from the list of um, specialties outlined here there's quite a long list of specialties that um that are that are outlined here and that with a wide variation so clinical genetics and hematology emergency medicine general surgery general practice all in there um and so uh, so it's it's really uh, quite interesting that we've got people that are having COVID outcomes on more than one year that we need, know we need to, to sort of try and improve that recovery process. Next slide please. So these are just looking at the surgical and the medical specialties across all surgical and all medical specialties just to show it, give it, give a snapshot. So essentially what it looks like is um, anywhere up to 26% of surgical trainees either have um, had to extend or are at risk of extending their their training and will not CCT as, as planned. So that, that basically affected about 700 surgical trainees in 2021 and we're still working on this year's figures. So really just important to know that, that it's impacting a large number of trainees and that we're aware of that and the data really reflects that. Next slide please. And this is the, the same um, year uh, breakdown for medical specialties. And I think it's important that we recognise that although these numbers proportionally look less, there's, there's more than double the number of medical trainees than there are surgical trainees and still 365 people were affected last year. So it's really to say we know that we've got issues across all specialties, as, as Matt was saying, there are more problems in, in some specialties than others in terms of that recovery but actually we're aware that all trainees are important and 365 medical trainees we need to think about them as well as we need to think about the 760 surgical trainees so it's just understanding how we can tailor our recovery program accepting that those individuals will have different needs um, and how we best um, meet those needs. Next slide please. So if we have a little look at sort of feedback we've had so far, so we um, at HE we, we sent out a, um, a questionnaire looking at those that had received um, outcome 10.1 and 10.2s and TPDs that had trainees that, that fell into that category. And essentially what we were what we found was we had uh, reports back from over 600 trainees and around 148 TPDs. Um, and essentially this just tried to give us a bit of feeling about what the main problems were and and what interventions have been put in place already. Next slide, please. So this really um, is, I think, is a really good uh, summary slide. So it, sh it shows some of the barriers that we found and that were highlighted by trainees during during that questionnaire. So things like elective cancellations, very high up there, and also high workloads, high bed pressures, staff shortages and absences due to sickness or to isolation. Then clinical capabilities and the fact that you weren't necessarily seeing everything you needed to, to get through training. So once you'd seen patients with the same presentation multiple times, actually that didn't add anything more to your training um, training skills and, and gain of uh, capabilities. And then there were other things that were, were mentioned, but also about training wellbeing, which I think is really important. So absence as a result of COVID or, or requirements through COVID, burnout and motivation concerns. We talked a lot about um, moral injury at the beginning of the pandemic and throughout the pandemic and how people were having to make um, hard decisions and how we were going to support trainees and trainers in those decisions. So all of those things have come out and barriers have been highlighted. Nothing necessarily unexpected, but really important to have those things highlighted by, by trainees. And then there have been some, some, some suggestions which I think are really important, all very valid, things like ensuring training recovery as part of service recovery. And that is a dialogue that we certainly, from a HE perspective, have had with many key stakeholders, the fact that actually that's so important that, you know, every every opportunity for training should be should be maximised upon. Um, trainee friendly rotors, thinking about how we stratify trainees in terms of skills and experience and match them so that we can get the most out of the potential training opportunities. Um, having protected time, thinking slightly differently about study leave and actually, you know, actually taking a day off to go to a conference hasn't been something that trainees have been able to do recently, but doing um, things online has been and how we think about study leave in a slightly different way um, and also how we sort of use our workforce most efficiently to actually optimise training. Um, so then if we go to the next slide, please. So then we asked the same questions for TPDs. So I think, you know, that, that, that they basically reflected similar issues, but other things that came out were the challenges in terms of TPDs finding ways of their trainees getting enough clinical experience, clinic numbers and outpatient face-to-face -face issues were, were 
were being really quite highlighted um, and then access to exams and exam backlog but also you know we, we very much were aware of the fact throughout the pandemic that the, f the first challenge was to be able to deliver an exam the second was for a trainee to actually be able to pass it and so actually we, we, we were aware that that's a two-step process and challenges at both at both stages so I think that was really well highlighted um, and then lack of procedural exp experiences obviously that's challenging and, and we have to think about how we best recover from that and as we've discussed things like um, simulation and access to the to, to more training kit is important um, and so again extra solutions suggested um, and and to some degree implemented but obviously we need to work on how we get that um, get that right next slide please so in terms of what we could what could be implemented there is a whole database of case studies and I'm not going to go through them one by one but I do think it's it's useful that if you have if you feel that there's a gap in your region of things that haven't been delivered or that there are things that could be delivered it's really worth going to see if they've been done somewhere else because obviously then there can be a sharing your experience across different regions so there is a, a, a database of those studies at this um, link and it will allow you to be able to see what's also what's been done but also what you could do um, locally that maybe hasn't been implemented in your region yet um, next slide please um, so again so there's the, these are these are examples that have been brought to, to us at HE from different DMEs that have been implemented around the, around the country so again really worth thinking about whether they, that these are things that we could implement locally um, if there's gaps in your in your sort of COVID recovery or in your specialty um, then I think you know there are there are some really good ideas here and a lot of this is that it's been very difficult for that communication um, both regionally and also nationally those ideas to be filtered and to be uh, that sort of idea exchange and that's part of the, the the reason for tonight is to say there are people doing certain things have a look and see if that sort of would work for for your region um, and your trainees and actually see if we can use sort of have that sort of meeting of minds and, and implementation of some of those implementations that have worked well elsewhere. Next slide please. So I think one of the things that we've already assessed is when we do implement some of these changes and we really you know accept that COVID recovery is a real needed thing and that even when we try and sort of implement things we've had further waves of COVID we've had winter pressures it's been really really challenging and I think it's really credit to everybody that sort of we are we are recovering um at, you know trainees are being able to complete their training and um, they are going they are progressing through training and actually the numbers predicted are actually far lower than we thought they were might be although there are still a significant number of trainees affected so I think all of those things are very positive we just need to, to make sure we don't lose that momentum but also important to embed some of these changes that we make in our training for the future as Matt was alluding to and we've said often there were issues with training before COVID happened so if we can make some of those changes for the positive and then embed them for future training that's absolutely where we want to go and we can see some of the impact that we've already um, seen from those implementations such as increasing training confidence and well-being these are really crucial things that mean that the training um, progression will, will be more successful but also um, practical things like increased exam success and development of educators we clearly need educators and trainers to support our trainees and that's been really challenging for people to have that motivation while trying to produce and provide clinical care during COVID so now's the time to sort of um, improve that support across and increase that support so that um, so we've got an, enough educators wanting to continue in that role as well as people that are needing to complete their training next slide please so as I said, we're really keen to hear about any ideas you want. I would really encourage you to talk to your TPDs about um, issues if you've identified things that could potentially be supported from a training recovery perspective. But also we, we're very much keen to hear from you. Um, and, and there's an email address here that we will uh, we would be happy to hear from anybody who's got any comments. We'll also take some questions at the end of the webinar. I know they're starting to come in, um, but please do feel free to ask questions. Next slide, please. So it's a pleasure to introduce Mike Robinson. He's uh, an SD8 surgical trainee and he's going to talk to you a little bit about the trainee view of train of, uh, from a training perspective during the pandemic. And after that, we'll we'll conclude the, the didactic part of the webinar and take some questions. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, usual unmuting issues. Um, I'm Mike Robinson. I'm an ST8 vascular surgical trainee. Um, I am in the military. Um, I've got a family with a wife and two kids um, and um, I've been a trainee in London for the last eight years. I've known adversity, um, I've been to war zones, um, I've throughout my training failed exams um, managed to get through 
um, and got a vascular number, uh, you know, about five years ago. And, and, and everything's been plain sailing since then, really. Um, and then the pandemic hits. <laughs> um, I'm on a steep learning, learning curve at GSTT, um, but actually things were going really well. And then COVID starts to happen, everyone gets a bit worried, and then I catch COVID. Um, I work through that period. I am um, quite ill. Uh, my family is rather ill at the same time. Um, and um, I go back to work as soon as I can, probably a bit too early, but that's life. Um, and um, wonder how are we going to get through the next few weeks, months, which tends to be years. So at GSDT, I managed comms. Um, I worked nearly every day for seems to be months. Um, I helped run a line service. I did amputations at ITU. Um, the thing I'm most proud of was running a PTSD reduction scheme. We talked about moral injury earlier um, and we made um, a thousand mental health first, first aiders during that. Um, I um, then um, managed to get through um, the year, um, which was rather amazing, but that was using private sector operating um, and trying to be in work as much as possible um, to the point where um, I think I was at that point rather tired and at breaking point. I did realise this and I realised that myself reasonably early and I managed to access the health practitioner programme, which I hugely recommend. And it was direct access for five sessions of CBT. I've used CBT in the past, especially around exams and, and other things. And I found that just to be massively helpful. And anyway, so I thought everything was going really well. And I thought the pandemic was over as we all did. Um, and I um, th then uh, went to the Royal Free, um, which was which was which I thought brilliant. I can catch up on my cases that I've missed and hopefully carry on. And then obviously the second wave. I think we all saw it coming. Um, and then I caught COVID again. So second time COVID, family at home, busy life, um, worried about everything, um, and actually got to the point where I didn't have any da enough downtime and actually developed long COVID, which is news to the group um, that I didn't mention this before. I um, accessed again HPC, but then had some rehabilitation with the military, which I'm very lucky to have, but I know that is available to others. Um, during that period, I've managed to pass my exam. I don't know how, but um, I do know that a lot of work was put into to do so. Um, I um, got to kind of the end of my time at the Royal Free, um, kind of bewildered, worried, scared, and not at all feeling ready. And I, I'll be honest with the group and I'll be honest with the people I'm speaking to now. Um, I thought that I'd ask for an extension before the end of the year to, 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 to get more training. I think in the craft specialties, um, in the craft specialties, um, I, I really think that learning your, your, your craft and, and operating takes time. And if you don't get enough cases and if you don't feel ready that for that time you're a consultant, for me, I, I felt quite scared and, and really worried about, you know, you know, not being ready, really. Um, and then I went to Imperial. Um, I, I I think that when I joined Imperial, I was frightened of, of, of the expectations and, and worried about not being good enough without having, um, you know, the COVID happen to me. But I get there. I meet Celia Riga, who is head of school, but um, is, my, is my trainer. And I was enveloped onto a firm based training pro program that gave me a tailored placement with individualized training, which allowed me to plan what cases I need to do with my colleagues and also then planning to work, being able to do to try and catch up with the training that I required. We also as a, as a group or um, and it was training led and of course trainer led set up weekly um, training and team training place um, um, simulation where we were able to do the more tricky operations and also use simulation in the simulation lab as a team 
which actually works out on a few times that we do the case the week before or a very similar case the week after. And I'll give you a story about that because what he, what the deanery did in London, and I think this has been fantastic, was they did cadaveric workshops. But these are cadaveric workshops where you've got superstar trainers that may be your trainers or trainers from other, uh, other sensors taking cadavers and taking ST7s and ST8s that are really at the end of their tether in terms of being able or, or, or worried about finishing training and taking them through the more difficult, I suppose, end of the scale. So things like aortic aneurysms. And I had a trainer um, on table um, by the name of uh, Mr. Mike Jenkins, president of, um, president of the Vascular Society at the time, um, who took me through an aortic aneurysm repair top end and Luck would have it that two weeks later, we had a rupture um, on call. Mr. Jenkins was on call, I was on call at the same time. I was able to go down, discuss the case, speak to him, and then go into the case with him knowing my skills and my abilities, which allowed me to then complete that case to a standard that I would never have been able to do or let do if he hadn't seen me in that training session before. I, I think that having these skills put into practice in the cadaveric workshops that were being done that are funded by HEE have um, made me almost think with such a more bright view about CCT. And then the same thing happened again last night, which I'll tell you that Mr. Gibbs and I did um, a team training thing on a Friday. We did um, some graft um, modifications and I was able to do that on the table yesterday to allow my training to to, to, to be maximised. I, I think that without the programmes and the individualised care and the care I've had from the Health Practitioner Programme and the individualised training I've had um, at Imperial, which has been pushed through by the Deanery, and I know pushed by HEE, I just wouldn't feel ready for CCT. I think I'm going to go in having an MCR, which also influenced my training um, two months ago to another MCR where I've made vast improvements in my abilities and confidence more importantly. Um, so I'd like to give the trainees and, and whoever else is on the call some advice really. I think the first thing I did was put my hand up and said I'm struggling. Um, I, I went a half day off a week or nearly a day off a week most weeks during that period to get myself back on track and actually taking that time out actually allowed me to really think and really kind of strategize, I suppose, well, how am I going to do this and gave me the energy to then carry on. I think we can all get caught up in we need to be in work all the time and that'll be my last thing that I'll say and I'll move on. To, I'm going to move on, but I'll mention it at the end. I think you need to find your hero or your trainer. Um, they might find you, you might be lucky enough to find them like I did, but there are people out there that will really support you and that might not be your local trainer, you know, it might not be your local trainer, but you will find people that are really into this and there's enough people in this group, enough people in, in the country at the moment that want trainees to be looked after and I think those people are out there and if you're not, if it's not the trainer that you've got at that time, I think you go find someone else because there are people out there. Um, or say that they're not doing it and then HG will sort them out. Um, the, the, the other thing that I think London Deanery has done very well is manage the money well. I think there's been a lot of one shot, you know, shots, sh shots in the dark. I think that whatever happens in the future has to be sustainable. Uh, and, and I think Matt said this, that it can't be one shot. It has to be something that carries on. And I think there's a real opportunity here for um, yeah, for some real sustainable training program improvements, which is a great thing to come out of the pandemic. I think, you know, the stuff I did during the pandemic, like the you know, lines and, and the um, you know, tracheostomies was, was great and there were new skills, but I think, you know, we've got to think about our specialties. I think that you've got to rest, you know, I think that you've got to look after your health. I think that you need family time and balance while catching up. And I don't always do it well, <laughs> but at least I've got some insight. And I think getting that help in, in um, you know, with some CBT and some, you know, mindfulness that, you know, use this app. Actually, I did use the app and it did work um, and doing some exercise and all these things does really help. Um, as I said, 
I don't think I'd have been ready to CCT. I now feel confident that I will CCT, but also understand that um, I'll be in a place that will be supported by my colleagues and 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 um, my trainers. Um, and that's it, really. <laughs> I think it was, you know, I, I, I think I've had a tough time. I think everyone's had a tough time with this pandemic. It's not over, um, but I think that um, there are things that are happening and need to happen and are happening that will um, allow us to, to, to finish training and, and be the consultants we all deserve to be. Thank you. And back to um, Professor McClough. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mike, for um, being so honest, being brave enough to share um, both how the technical things can be helped, but also how the personal things can be helped. That was very powerful. If we move on to the planned actions, the next slide, please. We have secured funding, as I said, for next year. We're going to try and prioritise funding using a risk matrix that helps us look at which specialties are most at risk, which geographies are most at risk, because some geographies were affected more than others and some specialty more than others. But one of the main things is to learn from the work that we've done. So as well as a quick evaluation and an awful lot of work comparing initiatives led by Gita Menon and Gary Wears, the two deans in London, we're also doing a multi-year academic evaluation so that we do have the evidence to feed into the reform work going forward. So. We've had some proposals that have been highlighted by Anna that you can see on the web page. Schools and DMEs that have possible proposals, please discuss them with their deans. And um, especially, as Anna said, trainees who have ideas, if you can please let us know and also highlight them, as Mike was saying, whatever their ideas about, whether it's about um, support or whether it's about ideas on the technical side of training, then let the DMEs and TPDs know. So, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Shauna. Uh, and again, huge thank you to all the presenters today. Uh, really fantastic. And um, uh, a particularly big thanks to Mike for his honesty, as, Sh as Shauna said. It's the second time I've seen Mike present, and I think Mike. Once you get your CCT, I think you're going to have a portfolio career. One of them is going to be public speaking. So uh, uh, good luck with that. Um, OK, so we've got a few questions. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. The first two questions are going to combine and ask Shona and Gita to answer, please. So the first one is great presentation. I'll th say thank you on behalf of the presenters. Uh, I agree there's an opportunity. We've, we have had expansion of numbers and trusts are not recognising the PA time for trainers. We are doing more support and pastoral care as well as training needs. How can we emphasise to trusts to honour educational support time? There have been a number of informal and formal training and wellbeing initiatives to aid recovery of training. What advice can we give to trainees about ensuring they are accessing help that is out there? And also, there seems to be a discussion around 10.1's 10.2 ceasing in the autumn, the effect of COVID and training. Uh, e.g. curriculum competencies will be with us for a number of years as things work through the system. So Shona, would you answer the service and the 10.1, 10.2? And then Gita, would you answer the how can we advise trainees on the help that's available, please? Talk about how to sneak one, not a number of questions um, into one question. So what are we doing um, about making sure that trusts honour educational support time? Uh, we're doing a lot of work nationally. Now, the slide that's up says training recovery must be prioritised along with service recovery. So nationally, we are working with the leads in NHS England um, and improvement to make sure that guidance going out about service recovery, the discussions about service recovery, the discussions about service development, all consider training recovery. And part of training recovery is the people who do the training. So we are continuously emphasising the need for 
educator support, and that means time. Um, so we're doing what we can nationally. The deans are all doing the same in the regions, and it is a message that HEE is putting out repeatedly. And it's not just for doctors, it's for nurses, it's for um, healthcare professionals working in all the different roles, people in surgery, people in anaesthetics, people in clinics, um, on lots of medical specialties. If we don't make time for educational supervision, then um, training won't recover. So that's what we're doing nationally. Um, and before Gita, you go on to say what advice you would give to trainees. Um, I was going to cover the 10.1 and 10.2. Um, there are two questions relating to that. One was the outcome two and three were significantly more frequent in the recent time period. And so some of them might have been COVID related and that we need to think about that when we're looking at whether the tra training problems with COVID are going and how effective the solutions are. And we recognise that. And that's one of the reasons why we're considering how long we should use the COVID outcomes for and how long we should um, we should separate them out because it does appear that they're getting muddled in ARCPs. And if we think that actually no outcome in an ARCP should be um, an adverse outcome, and what we should be doing moving forward from COVID is individualising training, not because of COVID, but because people need to have support with their training that is individualised. So that is the thinking around changing the outcomes. And we are very aware that there is a mix in how different outcomes are being used. So we're not deluding ourselves that the problem has gone away where there's less 10.1s and 2s, but there are more outcome twos and threes, um, but we are considering what's the best way going forward. So Alan, that's those questions answered, but I'm going to pass now to Gita to talk about how do trainees access um, the wellbeing initiatives and what advice we can give them to make sure they can get the help that's out there. Gita. Thanks. Um, thanks, Shona. So I think that um, firstly, it's really important, like all of the trainees and Anna said, that you know it is recognizing that you want help and making sure that you go to your you know supervisors, to your TPDs, to your head of school, you know whoever is out there to help you, so that they can actually direct you. We have um, you know used a lot of the training recovery money to actually have um, DMEs set up individual conversations, one to one conversations between supervisors and trainees last year, and that really helped identify trainees that really needed that extra care and that extra support, which was everybody really because after the redeployment and, and you know the pandemic, the things that happened at the pandemic, people did want to have that support. So I think it's really important to access it because it is out there. There, are every specialty and every program has developed a lot of well-being initiatives that can be accessed through the through these programs. Thanks, Gita. Uh, I think this next question is for you as well, Gita. Actually, will HGE provide specific funding? for cadaveric training, surgery, gynae, anaesthetics, and ODP in theatre staff, et cetera? Yeah, I think that um, we, um, like Shona mentioned, um, they, they, this year we have got money for um, further training recovery, supporting training recovery, which is 25 million of which 20 million is going to go down to the regions. So it's really important that if you actually feel you want to have that in your regions, then to contact your head of school and the postgraduate dean so that they can actually set up these um, cadaveric training programs. And Mike will tell you that the cadaveric training simulation programs actually were um, with all the different teams, so it's not actually just a surgeon operating. They had the whole theatre team there, so I think it's really useful to get in touch with your dean. Thanks, Keita. Anna, if you could take this question. Do we have neurodiverse disabled people and people with long COVID at the table in discussions and training so we make sure training is inclusive? It can be a tricky thing to include everyone, but so valuable. 
I completely agree. I couldn't agree more about the importance of it, of getting everybody's views. And I think particularly us reevaluating what that what that landscape looks like on a fairly regular basis. So, yes, you know, that I think more than ever, um, the different uh, training groups have really tried to include as many people and key stakeholders for which I would include all of those groups that were mentioned in the question. I think one of the things is thinking about a uh, long COVID, for example, so that's a relatively new concept. And now we've got and we do have to make sure that we're including people who represent those challenges in, in, in discussions. So HE certainly have reached out to a number of different training networks. And I think we just need to make sure that we're liaising and working with those networks to make sure there is that <laughs> that diversity of of sort of representation within them so that there is that proper feedback net mechanism so that we can make sure we've got as many needs covered and as many challenges identified um, and certainly I know working very closely with the academy group we're really keen to have as many trainee representatives from all of those different angles and and, and from every every other um, perspective um, so that we can feed that back into feed that back into HE and, and the plans going forward so yes but we need to make sure that we're evaluating it on a regular basis so that we are including all new groups such as those with long COVID that we hadn't really thought about before because they didn't exist. Thanks Anna. Um... OK, I think we are at the end of questions, which is uh, nearly perfect timing. Um, uh, just to confirm, we will be we've recorded this and we will be publishing it. Uh, so for those who haven't been able to hear, please uh, spread the word as it were. Again, a really huge thank you to all our speakers. Uh, as we've got a couple of minutes, would anybody like to add anything or say anything uh, before we finish? No, they're all silent. They're rarely silent, but they're all silent now. OK, thank you all very much. Um, have a wonderful evening uh, and thanks for your time. Take care now.